All right, I think we're going to get started. We were waiting a couple minutes to uh, see if anyone else comes in a little bit late, but if they come in a little bit late, they can just join us, I think, at this point. So first, welcome to everybody. I'm Andy Bauer. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the GDATF um, for helping to co-sponsor this with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and um, to everyone who helped organize it. So Kimberly was very uh, much behind the scenes to get things going on the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation um, behalf. And then we had a good team uh, of our own with two of our nurses. I don't know if they're still in the room right now. Kenya and Sandy on the Thyroid Center nurse team, um, Ashley and uh, Heather um, and Matt DiBattista, who's in the back. So in the back of the room, that reminds me, there's a table with more information about the GDATF and as well as the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and our Thyroid Center. So you're welcome to grab some more information packets that are back there. Um, and then, of course, the biggest thanks is to you guys for showing up. So thanks for joining us on Saturday morning. It's nice out, but definitely cold. Um, glad we missed the snowstorm. I'm from Buffalo, so I, I was feeling for my family was back home. Half of them were in the, in the snow belt and half of them weren't, so they were even within the same city, and that's how the lake effect goes. Um, but just a quick query from you guys. So I know some people, but I don't know everybody. So how many families here receive their care at, at CHOP? All right. How many families have patients that were diagnosed prior to age of 10? How about oh, the rest are over, so I won't raise that hand. All right. <laughs> How many people are still on medical treatment? So methimazole would be the treatment right now. Anyone who's had surgery or radioactive iodine? All right. And then how many people with family history of Graves' disease or autoimmune thyroid disease? How about Hashimoto's, hypothyroidism? All right, good. So not an unexpected uh, hand raising, I think especially for the last questions, because this disease runs in families. So. Um, I will get started, and here are the goals of my talk. We're going to talk about, I, I think I have the longest talk, so there won't be three talks that are this long, so I'll take the brunt of the time. But my goal is to kind of just go over why Graves' disease develops, if you haven't heard that before, um, and to help reinforce some of the things that we get for, for labs, because I think it's important to educate families and parents uh, and kids why we're getting labs, what we're checking, what do the numbers mean, <laughs> And then how are we making adjustments to medication? Because without that understanding, then it just becomes you show up, you hear what the doctor has to say, and you leave, and then you have symptoms, and you're, and you're not sure what we could do to potentially change our, our approach to taking care of you. So knowing what we're doing is a really important part of this whole process. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how long can you be on medicine, and is there any benefit to staying on medicine for a long period of time? Uh, and is there any, when should you and who should and how should folks decide if it's time to seek definitive therapy, which is to permanently, the goal these days is to permanently get rid of the thyroid, either surgery or radioactive iodine ablation. So we'll go through how we select um, doing that process and, um, and then hopefully hear from you guys on what you think it means to leave, live with Graves' disease and how you've made these um, interactions with your physicians and how you're doing as far as your approach to, um, you know, how things are going. So along that last line, there are cards that were handed to you, and sometimes it's hard to stand up and ask questions, so the purpose of the cards is to write down your questions. So any question you want to ask, I'm not sure that we'll have all the answers, but hopefully most of them. Um, so we can collect them during the time. If you run out of cards, um, we'll pass out some more cards. So in between talks, we'll collect those cards and then we'll wait to answer them at the end because some of the questions may actually be answered in the subsequent talks after, after mine. After this talk, there will be a bathroom, get more coffee, get more food break because it is the longest time, and then we'll go on for the rest. All right. A couple take-home messages. Um, I always try to reinforce this because I think there's some conditions that people wonder, like, how could I have missed the diagnosis? How could, I, how could it have been so long? You know, looking back at the symptoms to know um, why did my child have all these things and I was wondering what happened and you know you're kind of uh, assuming it was just kids being kids or teenagers being teenagers and then you realize it was Graves disease and there's some guilt to that that's common um, so don't feel bad that's just the way that this diagnosis is it's usually an insidious or kind of slow onset and many of the symptoms are 
kind of age-appropriate symptoms or signs um, that sometimes are more extreme, but it's not uncommon for people to kind of have symptoms for months before someone finally figures out that they have Graves' disease. There are three treatment options. They're all excellent. Um, the question is, how do you apply that to the person, where they are in their life, where they're going, and um, we'll talk about how we get to those points. Multiple approaches to care. This is our approach as a children's hospital filling the thyroid center. That doesn't mean it's the only approach. So there's lots of different ways of evaluating and treating Graves' disease. But I think there's some really important tenets of treatment, things that you really have to know about before people are making decisions to change meds, to stop meds, uh, to think about um, seeking definitive therapy. And then the last thing is, um, this is an unpredictable disease. And people, I would guess in the crowd, how many people have experienced the ups and downs and sideways motions of Graves' disease, right? Right, so there's, there's a lot of waxing and waning in the symptoms, and some of it has to do with the antibody production. Uh, some of it is not completely avoidable uh, or predictable. So here's the organ in question, or in the focus of our discussion. So the thyroid gland, and when you go see your physician, if someone's wondering if you have an enlarged thyroid, this is the easiest way to do it. So if you lift up your chin and you see the outline of this thyroid, then you have an enlarged thyroid, which is called a goiter. Pretty easy, it sits right under the skin, it sits over the windpipe, and if you can see that outline, it means it's enlarged. The system is a feedback system. This is true for all the endocrine system. So the thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone. It depends on how many iodines are attached. So when you buy iodine in the store, you have to, uh, when you buy salt in the store, you should buy iodized salt because you need it to make thyroid hormone. And then the lab kind of tells us what normals are based on the laboratory value, but it's our pituitary gland at the base of our brain that tells us what's normal for each of us. And then it sends a signal to the thyroid to tell it to work more or to work less or to, you know, somewhere in between. So it's a constant feedback loop. And for, the most, and for most of us, we have a set point. It doesn't change much over time. When we do ultrasounds, this is what the thyroid gland looks like. So it's wrapped or cuffed around the trachea, and then it has kind of this smooth gray appearance to it. The most common thyroid disease, of course, is hypothyroidism. So all states in the United States screen for this. It's one in 2,000 babies. Um, oftentimes, when this happens, it's because the thyroid gland didn't form normally. Just out of um, education, the thyroid gland actually starts in the roof of our mouth, it travels through the base of our tongue, and ends up in the front part of our neck. So it's one of those, how does everything go right to end up in the right place for it to work? And one in 2,000 times, it doesn't. And so we screen for that because babies don't have symptoms. If you have a thyroid that works normally, and then it stops working normally, we call it acquired hypothyroidism because you acquired it. And the most common reason is your immune system started to attack your thyroid gland. So the flip, what we're talking about today, is hyperthyroidism, much less common in the newborn period. So there is a form, it's very rare. They could be born with a, a activating genetic change in part of the system that causes you to have it. But acquired hyperthyroidism is usually what most people have, and that's what Graves' disease falls under. So Graves' disease is just described after an Irish physician who initially noticed the signs, symptoms, and realized that this was an autoimmune acquired hyperthyroidism. And why does it develop, and, and what happens when you look at it? So the thyroid gland gets big, right? So you can see when you lift up your chin that it's big. It can be symmetric or asymmetric. It can be one side or the other that's big at first, but usually it ends up being the whole thyroid gland. And when we look at ultrasound, you can see, compared to this, that the thyroid gland takes on a much greater amount of tissue. It's making more thyroid hormone. So it's an autoimmune disease, right? So what causes autoimmune diseases? Well. There are some people who raised their hand and said, you know, it runs in our family. So there's a genetic predisposition. You can't change that, right? Our family's our family. So if you have a risk for it, you're going to have a risk for it. It doesn't mean everybody in your family is going to develop it, but some people in the family are going to. And what kind of turns that on for each person are probably two other things. There's things in the environment, these triggers. It could be how much iodine do we have? Are you iodine deficient? Do you have iodine excess? selenium, certain infections can turn on the immune system and all of a sudden the immune system is attacking your thyroid because it looks like whatever the infection was that it was fighting. Certain drugs, certain pollutants, there's a lot of things in this list and it's different for every person. So when it develops, kind of it depends on what your trigger is and when your exposure is. And then there's endogenous factors. Who are you? 
What's your microenvironment? Are you male? Are you female? Are you before puberty, after puberty? Are you in your 30s and your 40s? All those things also play a factor of if and when this is going to develop. Vitamin D may play a role. I think vitamin D has gotten a lot of extra press. I think it's important. Uh, and probably if you look at populations, being iodine deficient may increase your risk of autoimmune disease. So it is an important vitamin, but it's actually a hormone that has to do with regulation of absorption of calcium. And then leaky gut. So how, much, how many proteins can get through the, we have a blood gut barrier, and are they, is it leaky or not, and can bigger proteins get through that our immune system reacts to? So there's different issues with that. And the other part of the gut is if you look at the world's population, um, more developed countries, because we keep spraying things with antiseptics, has its benefits. We have less diseases, less parasitic infections, but the flip side is we have more autoimmune disease. So if you look at the world's population, underdeveloped countries have less autoimmune disease compared to developed countries. So there's a, there's a lot of factors that play into this. And the one thing that we're talking about today is thyroid, but what other autoimmune diseases run in your families? Probably potentially a bunch of other ones. So if you have autoimmune thyroid disease, you may be at risk of some of these others, but a little bit less common than if you have some of these others to have a risk of thyroid disease. One prime example is diabetes. So if you have type 1 diabetes, you have a high risk of hypothyroidism, autoimmune thyroid disease. But if you have hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, you have less of a risk. So it depends which one developed first. But as a whole, they run in families, and they affect all these different organs. So in the brain, multiple sclerosis, in the joints, rheumatoid arthritis, in the skin, vitiligo, uh, hives. Right? People have seen hives they've had with Graves' disease. Uh, scleroderma in the muscle and the lungs, asthma, right, an autoimmune disease that can run in families that have hypo or hyperthyroidism. In the gut, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, all these things, blood, hemolytic anemia in the nerves, the pancreas is diabetes. So all of these organs are affected by autoimmune disease. The most common happens to be thyroid, and that's what we're talking about today. So here's why it develops. For hyperthyroidism, your body or whoever has hyperthyroidism in your family developed an antibody that happens to look like TSH. So it's called TSI. The difference is it's not part of this loop. So there's no regulation. If you have this antibody, it's attaching to the cells in the thyroid gland and it's telling your thyroid gland to make too much thyroid hormone. And when it does that, there's no regulation. It'll just keep doing it and doing it and doing it until this antibody disappears. So knowing what this antibody level is is part of the diagnosis, and knowing what that antibody level is is part of the treatment and when you're making decisions if you should continue or stop thyroid hormone. So it's a really important uh, antibody, and it's a functional antibody. It isn't just a marker. It is actually causing the problem. But autoimmune thyroid disease is a spectrum. So people kind of get stuck on, is it Hashimoto's? Is it Hashitoxicosis, which is this hyperthyroid phase of hypothyroidism, or is it Graves' disease? It turns out that autoimmune thyroid disease is kind of a pool and kind of a spectrum. So on one end is hypo, too little. On one end is hyper, too much. But it's a kind of a pool of antibodies. There's some blocking antibodies. There's some neutral antibodies. There's that stimulating antibody that I just showed you. And it depends on what that pool is, which we have no control over, on what your symptoms are. And that's part of the reason why we have this ups and down, these ups and downs and as far as symptoms. So if you have more stimulating hormone around, you have hyperthyroidism. If you have less, then you have hypothyroidism. And it can be months apart between these things that the, that the fluctuations happen. So we have these ups and downs. And so you know, one month you could be decreasing, a couple months later you could be increasing, and it goes back and forth. And some of that may just be the disease. Some of it may be because people aren't following the TSI level and trying to change dosing. But some of it's the disease, and some of you feel after a while that it's like, what is going on? And that's one reason why you think about doing definitive therapy. When you've had it with ups and downs, then that may be a cut point to say, all right, I'm throwing in the towel, but what else could we do besides medical treatment? So are you alone? Well, one in 10,000 kids will have hyperthyroidism. If you think about how many kids in the United States or how many people under age 20, it's about 8,000, you know, 8,600 8, people in the United States under age 20 right now have hyperthyroidism. You're not alone. There's lots of people out there within the pediatric age group that have this. 
So is it rare? I don't like the word rare, because if you have it, you have it, right? It doesn't matter if it's rare. To you, it's that you have hyperthyroidism and you're not alone. So signs and symptoms. Who had some of these symptoms when they first presented with hyperthyroidism? How many people had restlessness or fidgetiness? Yep. Increased appetite. Heart racing, feeling like it's beating really hard, right? Hot or warm all the time or just intolerant to heat. Yep. Going to the bathroom more frequently. Muscle weakness. Anyone notice if they had muscle weakness? So hyperthyroidism causes proximal, like shoulder and hip muscle weakness and diaphragm. So for our athletes, they, don't, they might kind of be able to put up with it, but they don't perform as well. Tired. I mean, even though you're revved up, you're constantly tired. I've had people like fall asleep on my table, not because I was just late to get into the room, but because they really are fatigued. Um, and then change in menstrual cycle. So irregular, less frequent menses. And then this is the tough one, like all these symptoms, like is it kids, is it not kids, is it teenagers, not teenagers, is it everyday life? You know, and there's probably some baseline. All of us have a little bit of moodiness. You know, it depends what side of the bed we get up on in the morning type of thing. But throwing in hyperthyroidism really increases those risks and those symptoms. So moodiness, anxiousness, decreased memory, there's a bunch of things on this that we're actually, are very common and we're very interested in actually studying and we have a protocol uh, that's about to get started to try to look at that and actually define what we're doing as far as treatment, as far as the impact on trying to improve some of these symptoms. Just quickly on the weight loss or weight gain, if you look at patients that are hyperthyroid, they have about a 50% or more increase in how many calories they're burning, so it's no wonder that they're hungry. If you took a teenager, they're more hungry anyway because they're growing, and then you throw in hyperthyroidism, they're more hungry after that. The tricky part is once you fix them, as far as their numbers, if they don't change their habits, they will gain weight. So once you treat them, you really have to be careful that their constant eating does not continue. If you look at the people that walk into this with hyperthyroid, if you're overweight before you're hyperthyroid, you'll lose weight, and oftentimes you gain weight above where you were. So we use BMI as a marker of, of weight to height. So you may end up higher in weight because of that. If you were underweight to begin with, you may not experience that. So there's different populations as far as risk, but it's something all patients need to be aware of. The risk factors, at least from one study that was published, was younger age and female gender. So girls seem to be more at risk in female gender, but this is one study so that may have been the, just their population. But across the board, I think it's something you just have to be careful about and thoughtful about when you're taking care of someone with hyperthyroidism. This is the other one that always gets us. We have a bunch of patients that were totally fine, and they had great school performance, and they were very focused, and all of a sudden they developed ADD or ADHD when they were 12 years old. That does not happen. Uh, most patients have those symptoms prior to school age, and then during school age they're finally diagnosed because they realize that it isn't just someone who's kind of rambunctious and you know, a crazy four-year-old, but it's someone who can't sit in their chair and focus, even in a, an environment that they need to for learning. So if you are fine and then all of a sudden you developed ADD, ADHD symptoms, get your thyroid functions checked. It really is a, a high risk time period and it usually, uh, there's usually an explanation for it. It might be a social thing going on, but thyroid is in the list of late onset ADD or ADHD. The other catch though with that is if we look at numbers and we look at people, some people can have their numbers two and three times elevated and be totally cool, calm and collected for the most part. And some people can have their numbers two or three times elevated and be bouncing off the wall, totally disorganized. And there's really no direct correlation between those numbers and how the person feels. And that's another reason why we're so interested in trying to figure out this study that we have about to get up and running. It's not always a direct correlation. And the question is for those patients, if we normalize the numbers, do we make them feel better? And that's part of our study, that we do this neurocognitive battery, it tests memory and it tests a speed to do things as far as brain function. It's a computer-based test at the time before they're on medicine, and then once they're on medicine, their numbers normalize, and once their antibodies normalize, and trying to figure out if we fix numbers, do we fix people? Because there's some people, the numbers are normal, and they still feel funny. Has anyone experienced that? Where the doctor says, your numbers are perfect, and you still don't feel the same as you did prior to having Graves' disease? Any hands for that or no? So it, there are some patients that feel that, and that's one thing we have to figure out is that a family that will, that person will ever feel normal, or do we have to think about definitive therapy for that subgroup, even though the numbers were normalized? 
So the signs, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, tremor. I've had patients that couldn't zip their coat, button their pants, button their shirts, and handwriting. If you go back and look at handwriting, although do they have sloppy texting, right? I'm not sure. How many kids don't write stuff, right? <laughs> not very many, right? Oh, you do good. <laughs> Handwriting's important. Um, so handwriting is also part of it. And there's a study that was showing handwriting for a 70-year-old, but in kids who sometimes have sloppy handwriting, you know, I shouldn't talk, right? My handwriting is legible, so not all physicians that were, but I, I would try to write so people could read. Um, but look at handwriting. If you go back prior to diagnosis or after or drawing, you're going to see this marked difference in fluency and being able to be able to read um, what their, what their uh, letters look like. Muscle weakness, warm, moist skin, and enlarged thyroid that we talked about. A brewy is, it's a weird thing, but when people come in, you, they should listen to the thyroid. So they take the stethoscope and everyone's ready to take deep breaths, right? It's like this trained response for kids. But then we're holding it up to their neck and all we're trying to do is hear blood flow through the thyroid. So if it's really revved up, hypermetabolic, then you'll hear increased blood flow through the thyroid and it happens to have that weird name called a brewy. That's all that means. And then eye disease. And eye disease in kids is less, it's somewhat probably unrecognized. But I think it's more common than otherwise. Bill will talk about that. It may not be as great a risk as far as decreased vision, but I think it certainly is um, common. And then the degree of it as far as um, if someone needs to have something done or if we're going to wait to help manage what their eyes look like is something that we can talk about and Bill will address as well. So eye disease is not uncommon in pediatrics. Severe eye disease causing decreased vision is pretty uncommon. So here are the labs. So we want to check the labs that are part of the system, right? A TSH, a T4, and this T3. So T3 is not a normal thyroid function test for people to check because most people have hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is not something that we use a T3 for. But in Graves' disease, because it's revved up, it just makes sense that if you're making more thyroid hormone, you don't have time, the simplified version, to attach another iodine to it. So you can have a high T3 before you have a high T4. It's just the way the system works. So having, if they have, someone has a low TSH, you need to check what the T3 is, or you, your physician needs to check, because you can have a high T3 before your T4 is elevated. And then knowing what this antibody is, so checking the TSI is really important as well. So how do we treat? Well, there's medical treatment or there's definitive therapy. The goals of medical treatment are to stop the symptoms and to stop the production of too much thyroid hormone. And those are not exclusive things, and they require two different medicines. So oftentimes patients are put on one and not the other, but that's really not fair to the person because you still have the symptoms. And so oftentimes, and I'll show you, we use a medicine to decrease the symptoms while we're waiting for the medicine to stop the thyroid hormone production takes effect. So those two things are important. And definitive therapy, the goal is to permanently get rid of your thyroid whether it's surgery or whether it's radioactive iodine. With uncommon exception, we start with medicine. And there's many reasons to do that, but some of it is just the complications and some of it is because we hope that it goes away and we don't have to seek definitive therapy. So here's the medicines. We had, it takes some time for this anti-thyroid medicine to stop the thyroid from making T3 and T4. And in the meantime, we can use this other medicine called a beta blocker to decrease the symptoms. And we, that's a once a day, usually one before bedtime. And once the numbers normalize, then we can stop that medicine. So it's just a temporary fix. And while we're doing all that, we're trying to see if the TSI will go away. And if it doesn't, or you have a reaction to medicine, then we think about permanently removing the thyroid by surgery or iodine. On a cell level, and I won't go into this in great detail, but just to show you, so here's TSI that binds to this TSH receptor, and it makes lots of thyroid hormone. So when we're using this drug, it accumulates in the thyroid cell, and it takes time for this process to happen. That's the only reason why I'm showing you kind of this cell that I created on PowerPoint, is that this drug accumulates in there, and one of the important things with that is, if you look at how long it lasts in the blood, one, this can be a once-a-day medicine. We usually start with two to three times a day, but you don't need two to three times a day forever. It can be once a day, because it, it accumulates in the thyroid gland, and because of that, what it is in the blood and what it is in the thyroid cells are completely different. I have patients that are on this medicine because the antibody won't go away two times a week, and they're still controlled. 
So you can either use block and replace sometimes, which you block it and you give thyroid hormone back, or you can decrease the frequency. So knowing this is helpful to decide how you dose the medicine and how frequently you dose it and how you decide on what the next step is. But the goal is to have less of this stuff in the bloodstream, less of the T4, and it takes some time. It takes probably one to three months for our ability to stop your thyroid from making extra thyroid hormone. And if we allow you to be symptomatic for one to three months when we could have prevented that, that's not really fair to the patient. There's only one drug in the country, the U.S. now, since 2010, that's approved for the treatment of um, anti for hyperthyroidism without a black box warning. So in 2010, PTU, which we use, and it was the drug I use most frequently in training, received a black box warning because there's about one in 2,000 kids who had severe liver injury um, by using this medicine. There were tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people who didn't have that reaction, but because there was a choice, people decided, why well, use something with any risk when you can use a medicine that has less risk, and that makes sense. So because of that, I don't, if someone has a reaction to methimazole, I don't go to PTU. It might work. You may not have a reaction, but if you do, and you knew that this is a risk, then it's a discussion you have to have with the family. I don't like that risk, but everyone makes that decision, um, and as long as you're informed, it's not unreasonable. It's just something to think about. How it works again, as I said, it blocks the production. We start at whatever dose it is, weight-based. We check labs, I check labs every month. So because how long it takes to start seeing an effect, and I want to control people as soon as possible. I may not see you in clinic every month, but I'm going to check every month, and we're going to go over the numbers so we can make adjustments. And once this, we see the T3 and T4 decreasing, then we can decrease the medicine. But you never stop the medicine unless you know that this thing has gone away. Because if you stop it and this is still elevated, all you're doing is asking for trouble. It's gonna, your hyperthyroidism is going to come back again. So we start two to three times a day. TSH may be low for months. We don't look at the TSH to adjust medicine. We look at these two numbers to adjust the medicine. And eventually, once we get you on maintenance, it can be once a day, if not less. How many people have a reaction? Well, I'll just go over two studies. This study said 19%. It looked at 100 patients. Many of them happened within the first three months, and most of them were minor. So skin reactions, hives were pretty common. Anyone have hives when they started their methimazole? Yeah. And you continued the methimazole, or you stopped it? Continued? Did you take an antihistamine to help decrease the hives? And then it went away, and it, did it come back, or it went away? All right, so it kind of came and went for a while, and then it just finally disappeared. So it's, that's a nice story, but there's some patients that it doesn't. And again, if you can imagine, it's already bad enough having hyperthyroidism and then being itchy all the time. That's not very fun. Um, so we have some patients that it doesn't go away, and we seek definitive therapy because of it. But there were some more serious reactions that happened 18 months later. The most serious in this, in this group actually were in twins that both had hyperthyroidism, think about that. Like two kids in your family at the same time, the same age, having hyperthyroidism. So it does happen, 19% seem to be on the high side, and I don't see that clinically. And there was a more recent study that looked at about 1,000 kids, all under the age of 18, not 100. And the risk of having reactions, skin reactions, was about 18%, so very similar. But as far as serious reactions, like liver problems or blood, bone marrow problems, like blood cell production problems, very low risk, 0.5%, 0.2%. And this is the PTU column, and this is the methimazole. So we're mostly using this. So hives, cutaneous things are not uncommon. Um, sometimes they're transient. Sometimes we can stop the medicine and use antihistamines and restart it. But once you start to see some of these very uncommon reactions, but serious reactions, we stop it and we don't go back. Once you have a serious reaction, then we move forward to a different treatment. So hives can be terrible, um, or they can be not fun, but at least they disappear type of thing. Um, they may respond to stopping it. They may respond to antihistamines and then restarting at a lower dose. But I don't switch medicines, as I mentioned before. Liver toxicity and bone marrow toxicity, it's so infrequent, even when you treat 1,100 patients under the age of 18, that it's hard to know. Was it the methimazole? Was it just a risk because you have Graves' disease, like another autoimmune thing. You can have autoimmune liver disease, autoimmune bone marrow problems. Um, but stopping the medicine oftentimes leads to recovery. So there is definitely a, a medicine-associated risk. And if you develop these things, and we print it out on all of our after-clinic visit summaries, 
a fever, a sore throat, you don't feel well, emesis, you need to call your physician, let them know. We usually stop the medicine, we do some tests, blood tests to make sure that you're okay before we restart the medicine again. So being aware of the potential side effects, of course, is important for any medicine, um, especially for what we're talking about today, methimazole. So medical therapy and then definitive therapy. So why would we start with medical therapy if there's some people that have reactions and there's you know, other treatment options? Well, if you give someone that's hyperthyroid radioactive iodine, you can make it worse for a period of time before it finally gets better. And if you take someone who's hyperthyroid and you bring them for surgery to the operating room, it's a high anesthesia risk. So it's always better to control this before you decide to do something permanently. And then there's some people that it goes away, right? So why would we want to do something permanent when there's a chance that it goes away? How many people does it go away for? How many people have any family members that achieved remission? One. Remission is it went away and it stayed away for at least six or 12 months. One. So that's not very many people in a small group. Um, but it is possible. So how often does it happen? Well, it's less likely to occur in kids than adults, but we're a little bit more conservative in kids because we don't want to do something permanent. If we can do something temporary and it goes away, that makes sense. Um, but the overall number is probably 30%. So how do we get to that number? Well, there's two large studies that came out in the last two years that looked at that, and it looks like if you, there's, these are years, and this is um, kind of achieving remission based on different parameters, estimated cumulative um, rate of remission or the antibody levels going away. And this, at eight to 10 years, it kind of plateaued. So if you're gonna achieve remission, the antibodies went away and stayed away, you kind of have a slope up until about eight to 10 years, and then if you haven't achieved it, you're not gonna achieve it. So once you enter that phase, you have to make a decision, am I gonna stay on medicine? And if you're not having reactions, no big deal. Or are you gonna do something permanently because it's likelihood is not, that it's not gonna go away by itself. This larger study looking at 1,100 kids, again, somewhere around five to seven years, you start to flatten out on that curve. And so we have some time to figure this out medically. That doesn't mean we have time to figure it out socially or academically or, or um, based on sports because some people have continued symptoms. But there are a group of patients that will achieve remission. It may take some years to figure that out. What factors kind of predict who's likely to achieve this? We used to have this list, and we used to go over this. But when we looked at that study that had 1,100 kids, it turned out none of those were actually really predictive. So if you're going to achieve it, you achieve it. We check levels, and we deal with each person individually, whether you fell into this risk or not. So that paper that came out this year, none of those predictors held true. The big thing families have to be aware of is if it goes away, it can come back. So 50% achieve remission. Why was the number 30%? Well, because 30 to 50% of the time, it'll come back. And it'll come back within the first year. So if we stop the medicine and we say, don't say see you later, you know, run for the hills, run for the sunset, you really have to be careful because it can come back. So what fa factors predict recurrence? Well, if you probably have eye disease or if you have a big gland or your labs. <laughs> and then what the antibody levels were. So this was looking at 50 adults. They stopped the medicine after the antibody levels dropped to normal, so that was a good plan. But then look how many of them recurred over what period of time. So this was 16 out of 48 recurred, and this is in adults, and the same thing happens in kids. So even though the antibodies go away, they can come back again. You just have to be very careful and don't wait six months and then come in after your child's doing poorly in school. Um, to have it reevaluated, be very cognizant of it. We usually check labs, even if the patient doesn't feel crummy, you know, every month, every other month, every six months, and really make sure, not just symptom-wise, but lab-wise, it's not coming back. So overall remission's about 30 to 35%, which is still reasonable, right? I mean, if 30% of the time it's gonna go away, it's not unreasonable to start medicine to begin with. So normalization of T3 and T4, if you get the numbers normal, you increase the chance of, recur of remission. So that's why we're so interested, one, in making you feel better, but also trying to set the environment that this antibody level is going to go away. So if you break this cycle, you have a chance, a greater chance that the antibody levels decrease. If not, then it's a vicious cycle. The antibodies are there, hyperthyroidism, and it just keeps going and going. So really having those numbers controlled, remembering to take your medicine. No one's perfect. You're going to forget doses but really being compliant with the medicine, getting your numbers normal has a big impact on how things are gonna go in the long term. 
if you look at what's the best path for the antibodies to go away, surgery and medicine seem to be more likely as far as how quickly those antibodies go away than radioactive iodine. And the reason is, one, medicine's blocking it, and surgery is you're removing the tissue that the body's forming antibodies against. So they're very similar as far as the antibodies going away. And for some patients that have eye disease, that's why we lean towards using surgery rather than radioactive iodine. One, the antibody levels can go up after radioactive iodine and make the eye disease worse. And two, in surgery, you're removing the tissue, and then you're decreasing the likelihood or increasing the chance for the antibodies to disappear. It doesn't mean that they're going to, but at least you're setting an environment where they might. So it's important to think about if you have eye disease or not, which path you choose. I've had a number of families come in and say, well, my doctor said I can't stand this medicine forever. That's maybe true, but not really as far as a medical issue. If you're not having side effects, you can stay on the medicine forever, whatever that means. That big study that looked at 1,100 kids, the longest period of time was 25 years. Now, I don't know if I would put up with Graves' disease and being on this medicine and risk of recurrence for 25 years, but if you're not having side effects, it's an option. So it's not like you get addicted to this medicine. If you need it, it's not going away and you're having no side effects. You can keep using it depending on how you dose it and what the convenience is, how many times you have to get labs. That plays more of a factor if you want to put up with this or not. Any benefit to long-term? We don't know. So no side effects, great. Keep using it. Is it of any benefit? There's just no data to say that it is a benefit after that kind of five to eight or five to ten year period where people plateau. So how to decide on definitive therapy? Well, here's our, our decision tree that we use. If you have a reaction to methimazole, especially a serious reaction, we don't switch. Then we talk about doing something permanently. Interference with activities of daily life. It's just getting in the way. No matter what we do, it's inconvenient. You're taking medicines two to three times a day. You don't feel the same. Adults don't put up with this. Adults seek definitive therapy oftentimes within 12 to 18 months, some people at the time of diagnosis. But kids don't make that decisions by themselves, and as parents, we hope it goes away. So we don't want to do that right away. We start medicine. That's reasonable. But this is, can be very debilitating um, and very um, difficult to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a cut point as we went to. Um, the, the graphs show you five to seven years. But in my experience, probably after two to three, four, five years, certainly not after five years, I haven't seen many people achieve remission. So if you're not going to achieve remission by that point, it's something to think about, especially if, you're, if it's, it's impacting your life on a daily basis. And persistent antibody levels um, is part of that other issue of it not going away. So in training, we used to say 18 to 24 months for adults. That's probably not true in kids, as I talked about. But there is a cut point. And then for patients that we stopped it and it came back, some families are interested in going back on the medicine. That's fine if they never had a reaction. Some people say, we tried, we gave it our chance, it's time to move on and do something permanently. And that's, again, a reasonable decision. But again, it's a choice. And family and patient interest. So persistent symptoms, persistent antibody levels, these ups and downs that drive us all crazy, not just you guys, but the providers as well. And the allure of the other side. What is hypothyroidism? So the goal is permanent hypothyroidism, but what's the trade? We well, take something that's unpredictable, multiple daily dosing, lots of labs, and you trade it for something permanent, but a pill that's once a day, labs every six to 12 months after you finish going through teenagehood and you know, reach adult stature, um, and stability of symptoms. I'm not minimizing that there's some patients that still report that they don't feel the same hypothyroid compared to previously. And there are some things that we can talk about not today or, or we can answer in question. I can answer in questions. Some patients that benefit from dual therapy, T3, T4. Um, but I think for the most part, the majority of patients feel fine on T4 only. And it's a much simpler existence being hypothyroid than hyperthyroid. So how do you decide between the two? Well, the goal for both is lifelong hypothyroidism. Both are effective as long as you pick the right person. So we don't we think about radioactive iodine, we do think about radioactive iodine for patients over age 10, for patients that don't have a huge amount of thyroid tissue. So if your thyroid, almost everybody has a big thyroid, right? But if your thyroid's four times as big, it's harder to destroy it with radioactive iodine. You might need a bigger dose, you might need a second dose. It is possible to do it. It just is more complicated 
um, to do it, and there's a higher chance of needing a second dose. So if it's really big, we think about surgery. Um, and Dr. Isaac will show you sometimes how big some of these thyroid glands can get. And then nodules. So we screen all of our patients before we go to surgery with a thyroid ultrasound for two reasons. One, you can have patchy uptake when you do the radioactive iodine, you're trying to figure out the dose. That can be part of Graves' disease. Then you get prepared, you miss work, you miss school, you get the scan, and they won't give you the dose because they're wondering if you have a nodule where that cold uptake is on the scan. So then to avoid that, we do the ultrasound prior, and then if there's decreased uptake, we know it's not a nodule. And the other reason is because you can have nodules in Graves' disease, and you can have thyroid cancer with Graves' disease. Most people don't, but we want to know about it when we're trying to make a decision what we're going to do with your thyroid gland or your son or daughter's thyroid gland. So there is an increased risk of thyroid nodules. We use both treatments. This is just 2009 to 2013, how many patients that we've selected or you know, agreed upon, the families agreed upon, and were appropriately screened between radioactive iodine and thyroidectomy. In my clinic, I think I have more patients that um, end up with thyroidectomy because I have kind of a biased population. The rest of the endocrinologists will, are more comfortable with radioactive iodine, but once they start making the decision about surgery, they come through the thyroid center. Um, so I see a different population. But here's the data, and we're just um, submitting it now for publication, that we've had in the last, you know, since 2009, we've had about seven kids out of the 32 we referred for surgery that had thyroid cancer. Two of them were kind of incidental were not clinically significant. They had surgery, they were removed. It was like a two millimeter focus. So you could have lived your whole life and that wasn't going to be an issue. But two of them that were significant were picked up only because we did ultrasound screening. So it's simple. Ultrasounds are, there's no risk to them. Um, and there's a lot of benefit from gaining that information. Again, most patients don't have nodules. Most nodules are not cancer. But knowing that information as part of the decision is really important. And then, who else should receive radioactive iodine? Well, if you're not a good surgical candidate, you have primary heart disease. Then it gets a little bit more of a risk for anesthesia. If you develop keloids, some people develop these scars that just overgrow, these hyper hypertrophic scars. So that may be less of a risk, but sometimes there's, the surgeons can do things to help minimize that, or plastic surgery can help sometimes as far as minimizing keloid formation. But there's some families that have this, and it's very deforming. Um, and sometimes com not completely unavoidable. For women, that antibody level can cross the placenta. So if they're 18 years old, they're thinking about getting married, having kids, you want that antibody level to decrease as fast as possible. Um, and so surgery is associated with a faster reduction in that antibody level. The risk to the baby is very small, 1 to 2 to percent, but it still is a risk and it's part of the discussion for older adolescents and young women. And then inability to kind of protect other family members. So you get safety precautions, um, and you're educated about that. We give you this road map. Um, but if there's no way to avoid that, then that's also a consideration. Radioactive iodine is colorless and odorless. You can't see it. You, know, you don't know it's there. So you have to follow some of these safety precautions. And then having the time, because it takes some time for the medicine to work. It's just like methimazole. Radioactive iodine doesn't kill the cells, and tomorrow you don't have hyperthyroidism anymore. It takes one, two, three, sometimes four months for the thyroid tissue to scour down and stop working. So surgery is reasonable, and, and surgery is reasonable only if you have a high volume surgeon, right? So if the risk of surgery, because you don't have someone who does it frequently, is high, you're somewhere in the Northeast, it's a little less common, but for pediatric thyroid surgery, it's just not done frequently enough that the risks at every center are low. So you really have to find a center that has surgeons that do this frequently to make surgery as low a risk as radioactive iodine ablation. So how do we have it at, the, at CHOP? So we have this multidisciplinary team that we've put together um, for thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer, and Graves disease, definitive therapy of Graves disease, plus a whole bunch of other um, thyroid disorders that we won't talk about today. But it involves endocrine, oncology, surgery, social work, um, pathology, it's, it's a team that there's one or two members from each of these divisions, there's about 10 divisions that we communicate regularly and all these divisions have done, you know, developed expertise because of that. Here's just a, a part of the list and some of the people are here today, so myself and Kenyon and Sandy are in the back, Dr. Adzik and Dr. Katowitz you'll hear from in a little bit, and then Ashley, Heather, Matt, there's a bunch of people that really help keep this center up and running 
And we're closely aligned with the adult centers. So if we have to transition care, when people are tired of hanging out in the waiting room with kids and they're 20 years old, you know, and the kids climbing all over them, then we can easily transition to the adult center at the University of Pennsylvania, which is also outstanding. So we have this whole kind of collection people come in and we can put them in a database. We can, if they consent, we can do, get them involved in research studies and we can try to figure out how we can do a better job of taking care of kids with thyroid disease. How many patients do we see at CHOP? There's about 40 to 50 new Graves' disease patients a year, not all through the thyroid center, but through the Division of Endocrinology. So that's a fair number of patients. And then Graves' disease doesn't go away. So this is accumulating year after year. We have a, number, we have a large number of patients that we care for with Graves' disease. As far as thyroid surgeries, we're probably the biggest and busiest thyroid center uh, in the country. In the last four years, we've had about 270 thyroid surgeries just between two surgeons, so Dr. Adzik and Dr. Kazahaya. So um, our risk of complications are quite low because of our surgical expertise. So radioactive iodine, we'll talk about just these quickly, and we're almost towards the end here. It's been around a long time. It's not something that just started. So this is after World War II that people started using radioactive materials and radioactive iodine in particular to help medically to treat patients. If people don't realize that it's a pill, it's a single dose pill, you can special order liquid if someone's little and they can't swallow a pill. So if you're 17 and you say you can't swallow Tylenol, we, you know, we try to encourage you that you can actually get this. And, but if not, if it's like a, a liquid or nothing type of thing, we can order liquid. Um, it's absorbed by the thyroid cells, but other tissues are exposed. But it's a very small amount of exposure. But because of that, there are safety precautions for home, for school, for travel. If you go to a national um, a museum, you go to an airport, you can trigger the radioactive sensors. They're amazingly sensitive. So you should have a little card that says, this is medical treatment, you know, um, just to be careful um, if you're gonna seek this form of therapy. How we select, I already talked about, so you have to be over age 10. Some of it is because we can't guarantee that the person is independent. So if they can't go to the bathroom by themselves, you don't know that they're going to follow the rules and other people might be exposed because of that, then we don't want to increase the risk of the family members. That's how the number was picked. And also because we worry the younger you are, maybe other organs that are exposed, there may be increased risk of other malignancies. The data hasn't shown that, but because of that, under age 10, we're a little bit careful with using radioactive iodine and usually select patients for surgery because we have the ability to do that. No significant eye disease, smaller gland, no nodules, and some time to achieve hypothyroidism, some patience. We use the dose and we base it on the age, how much the percent uptake is, uh, and what the size of the gland is. And this is what happens when you give it. So the, the gland lights up, this is the bladder. So you can see that you're not trying to treat the bladder, but because it's excreted in urine and other places, saliva, sweat, and uh, the intestines, so all those other tissues are exposed, but what we want it to do is just be absorbed in the thyroid tissue so that it's destroying those cells. So the emission, the radioactive emissions, like six or eight millimeters, it's very small. So if you stand next to somebody, you're not getting irradiated from their radioactive iodine. It's just if they sneeze on you or go to the bathroom or they're sweating or you drink from the same cup, it's that's where the exposure comes from, which is avoidable. So in clinical use since the 50s, no evidence of increased non-thyroidal cancers. Um, and this is just a typical treatment course. This is an 18-year-old, had no nodules, 70% uptake, or 78% uptake, received a treatment at the end of uh, October, and by um, the middle of January had achieved uh, hypothyroidism. Their TSI antibody levels were still elevated, right? So you can still see that, and they were, though, they were then started on uh, thyroid hormone replacement. So that's six weeks or so. We have some patients that take a little bit longer uh, to achieve. So thyroidectomy, selection is kind of the opposite. You can be older, but certainly the younger age patients, we think about thyroid surgery first. They have eye disease, they have a big gland, they have nodules. They're interested in immediate resolution of disease. You have Graves' disease today, tomorrow you don't, because your thyroid's not there anymore. And access to a high volume surgeon. The approach, we don't send patients to the operating room until their T3 and T4 are normal. It's not worth the risk, and there are ways to avoid it, so we give cold iodine prior. We're trying for a total thyroidectomy, and Dr. Adzik will touch on 
how we, other things that we use to try to monitor if there's gonna be risks of surgery. So we're very careful about monitoring the nerves that supply the vocal cords, because they go through the back part of the thyroid gland and they're very small, and the parathyroid glands, which are located behind the thyroid that have to be left in place, they control calcium. And so those are the two bis biggest risk factors if you go to a surgeon doesn't do it frequently, they could permanently damage those two, uh, either the nerve or the parathyroid glands. And there's four parathyroid glands. So here's a patient that was really hyperthyroid and was not taking their medicine because of reaction. Actually, this person wasn't taking it because they didn't want to, but we convinced them to take um, their medicine and to start on SSKI is cold iodine. And just looking at their T3, it went from six to five to four to two and a half, and then finally to a normal number and then they were ready for surgery. So we can get people ready for surgery. It takes about seven to 10 days to do it. Um, so if you developed hives or a serious reaction, there is a safe plan for achieving uh, surgical removal of your thyroid. The risk of surgeries I talked about, but if you go to a high volume surgeon, they're minimized. So permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve damage, less than one to 2%. Permanent damage to the parathyroid glands, less than three to 5%. So these things you can really keep to a minimum um, if you go to the right center. And the benefits, immediate resolution, more rapid decline in the antibody levels. Not a guarantee, but a more rapid decline and certainly not worsening of the antibody levels. So in summary, um, there are choices and everyone has to know what the choices are uh, and they have to be part of the decision. And you have to take your individual son or daughter or yourself or family member, whoever is with Graves' disease, and decide where you fit into that. Is it something that you're willing to deal with? You're doing fine on your medicine, you feel fine. There's no reason not to continue medicine. But if you reach a point or you have a reaction, then there are two other choices and then you have to decide how you select who's, which one's the better choice for you or your son or your daughter. So the goal is to achieve normal thyroid function as, as fast as possible so that the antibody levels will decrease to use these other medicines so you don't feel crummy while we're getting, waiting for that antithyroid medicine to work. If you're gonna have side effects, it's usually early on, but you still have to realize it can happen, kind of a delayed response, and you can use it long-term. And don't stop it unless you know what the TSI level is. Medical factors to consider we talked about, and then these psychosocial factors, which I mentioned we don't have a great handle on, but we're, we have a study right now that's about to get started to help figure that out. But your feedback to us is really important to the provider. Let us know how your kids are doing. There is no best treatment. Um, you have to individualize it, and you guys have to be part of the decision. So going to experience, a, a center with experience really does matter. Uh, it makes a difference medically. It makes a difference for definitive therapy. Uh, and then these types of things are things that we have going on right now, health-related quality of life, this study to figure out how people feel once we normalize numbers, and a study that we're just trying to get together now is when we counsel people, I mean, one of the disadvantages of surgery is you have a scar, and there's no way to avoid that. So what does that mean to have a scar? Does that impact people? Some people it does, some people it doesn't, but at least trying to figure out if it changes self-image um, is part of a, another one of our research interests. So I think that's it um, for mine. Mine is definitely the longest talk, as I mentioned. So we'll take a break. I didn't see any, too many people writing questions, so hoping that we'll take five minutes. Is that reasonable? People get a drink, get some coffee, stretch, get ready for the next two talks, which are much shorter. And then hopefully you guys start firing back some questions for us and um, we can go through some of those with you as well.